Well, hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, for oceanography. This is one of the last flip class lectures of the course. Today I'd like to start with a question. The question is, which group of organisms do you think scientists consider to be most successful of all the things that are oceaning around in the ocean? If you guessed mollusca, you would be correct. So we're going to look a little bit at the conspicuous features that phylum mollusca has in common, and we're going to look at some of the differences, and then when you come to class, we're going to cut some of them open. So here is a cladogram showing you uh, the different evolutionary relationships in phylum mollusca. Remember, this is a phylum, just like, you know, Porifera, which would be the sponge phylum, or Echinodermata, which would be the Echinoderm phylum, you know, like sea stars and urchins and stuff like that. So we have the mollusk. Phylum mollusca. You see that we have all these different groups. You can see how they're related to each other. The main ones that we're going to focus on uh, the bivalves, that would be the clams, and the cephalopods, those would be the squids and the octopi, and the really cool things with the whole head foot thing going on. Uh, it's worth mentioning though, there are over 200,000 different species of mollusk, and they're very cl closely related to annelid worms. However, they branched off just a little bit. Uh, before that, they're more like a nematode. They've got this weird body compartmentalization thing going on like the annelid worms, but they don't have uh, the same kind of segmentation that the annelid worms have. All right, so let's look at some of the weird uh, groups. Uh, C. elegans, this is one you may have heard of. These are the aplecophorans, and they look uh, worm-like. These are the most basal group, very, very similar to the annelid worms. They look a lot like worms, but they're not worms. They're mollusks. Here's some pictures. There's also polyplacophora, which has, you know, many placophores all over it. These are commonly known as the chitons. They look a lot more like insects, but remember, insects are arthropods. These are mollusks. Most of these live in those intertidal zones, you know, those shallow estuary type places where the water goes in and out a whole bunch of the time. Uh, they tend to be neuritic or benthic. However, many of them are free-swimming pelagic when they're in the larval stage, and they are marked by an eight-valved shell. By valvia, the clams we're going to look at, they have two valves. One, two. Bloop, 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 bloop. These have eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And they look crazy, so chitons. Now, there's several uh, different characteristics that many of the mollusks have in common. One of them is cephalization, especially with the cephalopod. That is where they have a head. They have most of their neural, neural stuff, their nerves and whatnot, concentrated in one area. We call that area the head. It's not necessarily the top of their body or the frontmost part of their body like it is with us. In fact, you're going to see on the squid, it's almost more in the middle, but it's where most of the nerves and the brain would tend to be. And to be a cephalopod, you also have to have the foot, because pod means foot, which means you're cranking out tunes on your iPod touch. You're actually checking out your eye foot and touching it. So they use that foot usually for movement. Many, 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 much all the mollusks pretty much have some kind of foot for moving around. They also tend to have this thing called a visceral mass, which is just this inner lining of tissues. And they have a mantle, also known as a pallium, and that's like a protective, like mantle's like a cape type thing, not the thing over top of a fireplace, but more like a protective like cape that you throw on against the cold weather outside. So I've got one of those. It's a thicker area that uh, protects them. Probably the coolest feature about all of the mollusks is they have what's called a radula, which is a tongue with teeth all over it. Textbooks usually describe it as rasping, which is, yeah, kind of gross. Let's look at some of the advanced structures of the mollusks. They have one or two groups of tenidia, which are weird, modified, uh, very basal gills. They also tend to have a posterior cavity. Posterior, that means it's, it's towards the booty. They have a cavity down there. Sometimes that cavity is actually surrounding the foot. They have different sensory organs that we call osphradia that they use to detect their environment. Some of these mollusks even have very simple eyes. The osphradia, though, are used for smell, and they have all of their organs compartmentalized off. They're one of the first, them and annelid worms, one of the first things they actually have different organs because they're coelomates, they have a body cavity. Some of the organs that you will find is a heart surrounded in a sac called the pericardium. Peri means around, and cardi means heart, so it's a sac that goes around the heart. They also tend to have very nice kidneys, 
Remember we talked earlier about why you would need to have a kidney when you are inside the ocean, right? The salt water, osmo regulation, kidney is the organ that's going to be doing that uh, for them. So let's look at the bivalves. All right, these are the clams, the oysters, the scallops, the mussels. We're going to cut one of these up. Uh, most of them are marine, however, there are some freshwater bivalves. You can actually find freshwater mussels. They taste delicious. Most of them are suspension feeders, which means they've got like this straw that they stick out and <laughs> slurp up a bunch of food, and they're usually they're feasting on the planktonic organisms or very, very small nectonic organisms that can swim just a little, little bit. You know, a tiny bit. And they also burrow using their foot, which comes out of their mouth like a little blade, and they just dig with it. So it'll look sometimes like, like they're Pac-Manning down deep, but they're using their foot like a little digging scoop. Many cultures uh, find them very, very pretty. In fact, the shells of many bivalves have actually been used as money in areas that aren't rich in minerals such as gold and diamonds and silver. Here's some bivalves. What's fun about bivalves is many of them have a larval stage and or even an adult stage that are worm-like. So you usually think bivalves like that. However, there are some bivalves like that. Gross. Here's a diagram showing the internal anatomy of a clam. We're going to cut one of these up. Remember, like I said before, we've got a siphon for sucking things in. But remember, they need to get rid of waste too, so they're also going to have a siphon to get the things out, which will be all up on the anal area. They've got all these different muscles. Remember, we said they have this really nice muscular foot. They're showing you that right there. They have nerves on their foot because these are pretty advanced things. They're ganglion. What they mean by that is brain. Remember, anterior is more towards the head, posterior is more towards the anus, so clams are actually kind of sideways all the time. Mouth over, or head over here, with muscles near the foot, and then the other end is going to be the anus, which is actually a little bit closer to what would be sort of like their mouth. Anyway, yeah, look at this diagram. You should uh, be able to find these things. Well, some of them anyway. Clam kind of looks just like a big glob of goo when you cut it open. So we're going to try and find many of these. You'll at least find the foot. You should be able to find the gills and the muscles. You're actually going to have to cut those because those are what uh, close and open the shell. There are also gastropods. These are the snails, the sea slugs, and stuff like that. They live all over the place, all over the place. They eat everything all the time. Uh, many of them actually act as decomposers. Most of these are going to be benthic. They live just on top of the plants. That's what I mean by epifaunal. They live just on top of plants and other animals and devourate them when they die. Uh, a lot of them are planktonic. They're floaters, not swimmers, especially the uh, sea hares. And those, uh, some of those would be violet snails, sea lizards, and blah, 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 on and on and on. Many of them actually are hermaphroditic, which means they're all heishis, gastropods. Some of the other groups that you may not have ever heard of that are kind of cool, Genthanidae, these are types of gastropods. See, oh, look at how purtyful they are. There's also Glaucus, which looks like not so much a gastropod, but here it is being more inside the shell, and then it's also got this swimmy little, ooh, look at them there. These will, uh, these will kill you. Cephalopods, these are the ones that we care most about because they're the most successful. They've got that big head, which is why they're called the cephalopod, because cephal means head. The one we're going to cut up is the squid, but keep in mind they also have the octopi, the nautilus, and also some things called ammonites, which are crazy. You should Google it. They're the largest, most successful group. They're also the most mobile of the group. They do lots and lots of swimming. Their foot has actually been modified into a siphon. It comes juts off right off their mantle. And then they've got this beak that looks uh, strikingly like the beak of a parrot. They're, they're, they're going to bite you. Uh, they have eight arms. All of them have at least eight arms. Some of them have uh, more than that, but yeah, they're, they're kind of scary. And they have a complex eye, which is very similar to ours. In fact, many of them actually have an eye that is better than ours, especially uh, the octopi. Not so much the squids and uh, cuttlefish don't see super too well, but yeah, many of the octopi, even some nautiluses, not a lie, I guess, they actually can see better than we can. They also tend to be highly intelligent. Here's one of my favorite web comics about the cuttlefish. If you got some extra time, ask Mrs. Steen about a story involving a cuttlefish trying to hit on her daughter. It's a, it's a pretty good one. It happened in the ocean. 
Their eyes allow them to detect color changes in the water, and many of them actually have krypton lens cells, the lenses for detecting the color, and many of them have crypt cells where they can actually change the color of their body. Cuttlefish do this, octopi do this, not many squid do it, so yeah, we're kind of cutting up the lamest of the cephalopods in my opinion, but it has the nicest internal anatomy, so we're going to do it. And inside the crypt cells, they actually have uh, this nice symbiotic relationship with a bacteria that live inside there and do the color changing for them. So they don't actually change their color by themselves. They send hormones very, very quickly that interact with these different bacteria that are responsible for bioluminescence and color changing, which is crazy. What's really crazy is here is a picture of a nautilus, insert poem reference to chambered nautilus here. And it's worth noting that this is not a gastropod, although they do have the delicious shell. And this all out here, those would be their eight plus arms sticking all out of the face region. And check out its complex eye. Got a good lens on there that can see stuff. Here's a picture of a giant squid. Uh, this is a ship. That is a really thick rope, like that big or long, and these are people's hands. Just give you an idea of, yeah, those things have been, uh, yeah, crazy. This is one of the first ones we've ever found. They're pretty rare. We know they're out there because uh, we see their destruction. Remember, these are very, very large, very, very intelligent organisms. When you're thinking of the Kraken, that's probably what it is. So let's look at some of the dissection slides for the squid. Here's the squid. You got the top side, the bottom side. We're going to be cutting along the bottom side. You'll know you're on the bottom side because you've got the siphon. All right. If you don't see the siphon, then that's not the right side. And on the top side, you're going to see the pen. Uh, check out, it's got its arms, and then it also has two longer tentacles that are more for feeding. All right, here's the pen, so that the wrong side. We want to flip it over. Look at the other side where you've got the funnel. When you get to the other side of the funnel, you're going to cut it open uh, just like this to expose its internal anatomy. A note on pinning. When you put in the pins, children, see how the pin heads are all out of the way. When you put in the pins, you want to put it in, if this is your tray, you want to put them in at a very extreme angle to keep the pin head out of your way. You can stab it right through the foamy gook of the pad and just drill right through it. If you don't do that, you're not going to get a very good hold on the pin. They're going to come up. This mantle that you're pinning down is very thick and you're going to have pin heads on the way where you're trying to work. So pin them at a very extreme angle. And really, you should just do that anytime you're pinning anything in a dissection. When you get it open, you're going to get a good look at its internal anatomy. You should be able to see its eye, see its siphon, ink sac, which will be really close to the anus so it can poop and ink all right into the funnel down here, which is nice, also called the siphon. You should see a heart up here and also two gill hearts down here. The systemic heart is very difficult to find, so don't feel bad if you miss it. A lot of times it gets mangled. You're going to see the stomach and or the cecum up top, which are really, really cool, unique digestive organs that only the cephalopods have. And then, of course, I'm going to give you diagrams so that you can identify all these things and make sketches and remember them and maybe lab practical. Yeah, probably not. We don't have enough time. For a little bit more detail on the uh, first cuts with your squid, I got a video here and a video here. You can click on these annotations or the links are also in the description. Thanks for watching, everybody. Let's get ready to cut up some animals.